Welcome to No Longer Conformed. I'm Eric Garthy, and we are studying experiencing God, knowing the will, knowing and doing the will of God, based on the book by Henry Blackaby. In this, in today's session, where we'll be looking at John chapter 14, verses 15 to 24, will you obey God's will? Let's read that passage. John chapter 14, beginning with verse 15. If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever, the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be, it, excuse me, will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. A little while longer and the world will see me no more, but you will see me. Because I live, you will live also. At that day, you will know that I am in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to you, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? And Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words and the word which you hear is not mine, but the father's who sent me. Listen, obedience is the outward expression of your love for God. If you have an obedience problem, then you have a love problem. That's simple. What is obedience? Well, doing what you're commanded to do. It's that simple. Matthew chapter 21, verse 28. But what do you think? A man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, Go, work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not go. But afterward, he regretted it and went. And he answered, and then he came to the second and said, likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of, the, of his father? And they said to him, the first. See, the beginning place for obedience, if you're not sure, is to obey what you already know to be the Lord's revealed will. The Ten Commandments. Love your enemies. Disciple all nations. Live in unity with other Christians. Let's, let's take a moment and look at two considerations of on obeying the will of God. First, the importance of obedience. Disobedience is a rejection of God's will. And there's always a consequence for sin. That's the, the importance of, of, of obedience. Luke chapter 6, verse 46. But why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? Whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I will show you whom he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when the flood arose and the stream beat vehemently against that house and could not shake it for it was founded on the rock. But he who heard and did nothing is like a man who built a house on the earth without a foundation against which the stream beat vehemently and immediately it fell. And the ruin of that house was great. So there's the, the importance of obedience because disobedience is rejection of God's will and carries a consequence. Well, then also the, the cost of obedience. Obedience requires a price of major adjustments in your life. John chapter 6, verse 66. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Churches miss doing God's will at this very point 
because they're not willing to pay the price of obedience when it involves adjustments in lives, plans and directions. Suffering is usually experienced. Galatians chapter 6, verse 16. From now on, let no one trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. And yet, look at Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already attained or am already perfected, but I press on, that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Was Paul willing to make major adjustments? No. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 22. I have become all things to all men that I might by all means save some. And our obedience to God's will is a cost to others as well. Moses and the Israelites, Exodus chapter 5, verse 17, when Moses confronted uh, Pharaoh, Exodus 5, 17, but he said, you are idle, idle. Therefore, you say, let us go and sacrifice to the Lord. Therefore, go now and work, for no straw shall be given you. Yet you shall deliver the quarter of bricks. Jesus and, and, and Mary in John chapter 19, her personal agony of a mother losing her son. Paul and Jason in Acts chapter 17, verse 1. Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And then Paul, as his custom was, went into them and for three Sabbaths, reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead and saying, this Jesus whom I preach to you is Christ. And some of them were persuaded. And a great multitude of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women joined Paul and Silas. But the Jews who were not persuaded, becoming envious, took some of the evil men from the marketplace and gathering a mob, set all the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, these who have turned the world upside down have come here too. Jason has harbored them, and these are all acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. And they troubled the crowd and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. So when they had taken security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. Adjustments to prayer are a cost of obedience. God is always the initiator of prayer according to his will. Let him lead you in God-centered prayer, prayer related to accomplishing his plans. Philippians chapter 2, verse 13, for it is God who works in you both to do and to will for his good pleasure. Romans chapter 8, verse 26, likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. What if you're willing to obey and the door closes? Acts chapter 16, verse 6 down to verse 10. The issue became God's way, Paul's way or God's way? Verse 6 of Acts 16. Now when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden 
by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. After they had come to Mysia, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. So passing by Mysia, they came down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Now after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. Listen, review God's instructions and see if you may have added something. Keep before you what God said. Let God work out the details of his timing. And do what you already know to do. And then wait for the, the next instructions. Let God set the pace. The God who initiated his work in a relationship with you is the very one who guarantees to complete it. Only through obedience, Moses found many crises of faith in leading the Israelites. Noah obeyed by building an ark and was saved. David became king. Abraham fathered a nation. Elijah prayed for fire from heaven and got it. And then there were Jesus' disciples in Luke chapter 10, verse 17. Then the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. In that hour, Jesus rejoiced in the spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have revealed these things, yet that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and revealed them to babies. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in your sight, all things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows who the Son is except the Father, and who the Father is except the Son, and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Then he turned to his disciples and said privately, Blessed are the eyes which see the things you see, for I tell you that many prophets and kings have desired to see what you see and have not seen it and to hear what you hear and have not heard it. John chapter 17, verse three, when Jesus was praying in the upper room on that night he was betrayed. John 17, three, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Let me ask you a question. As we conclude this look at experiencing God, knowing and doing the will of God, do you want to know and do the will of God? Do you want to experience him? Well, are you willing to obey? You answer those questions, and you have.